All right, welcome to week four. We have lots of nice sunshine outside. Uh, the weather continues to be shitty. <laughs> Just saying, you know. Um, okay, I guess if it's crappy, it's better being here than out there. Um, this week, uh, you should be uh, at least starting hybrid number three, if not hybrid number four, because uh, you only got another week before those are due. So try to get them done. Um, you should have this week, you're also going to be working on lab four, I believe. And, um, and then that's pretty much what you're going to be working on. What we are going to be covering today is the first part of the class is going to be fairly short. The slideshow is the shortest one yet, 13 slides. Uh, then what's happening is I'm doing an on-board on session, uh, on-board design session. So what's going to happen is I'm going to do an on-the-board on the start to end, including the physical design side of it. And then you'll see the, all the steps from start to end. Um, by the end of today's lecture and the end of these hybrids, uh, you will have all the material that needed to be taught for the first test and all the material that needed to be taught for the first assignment. Uh, the good news is I thought the assignment was supposed to be handed out today and then I had to cancel it because I found a copy of that assignment floating out there from a previous group of students. I, I reuse my assignments every few years and I found a copy of my assignment floating around with my comments. So that assignment is now permanently shit canned, which means I got to pull one out of my whatever by next week, which is good because that's when I was going to hand it out. So I just bought myself a week, but I thought it was supposed to be handed out today. Um, so it's going to be a similar assignment, just done a little bit differently. Um, so if those of you that have gone to Blackboard and looked under assignment saw something called assignment one visible, it's not anymore. It's gone. It's all gone. And it's gone forever. Um, yeah, when you find a copy, and it was actually one that got a decent grade. So it's somebody who got a good grade and said, then no, those are my comments, how they could have gotten it to almost 100%. And they, I guess they gave a copy to their friend that didn't do so well, and their friend shared it with other friends. And the next thing I know is I found a copy floating on the internet. And you could just literally search for the first three, a couple sentences from my assignment, and you'd find it. That kind of sucks for me, and it sucks for you guys. Uh, because I had gotten so good at grading that one, I could grade it in my sleep. But oh well. Okay, what are we going to cover today? Uh, I'm going to discuss resolving many-to-many -many relationships. Uh, that means when you diagram a many-many job, how to resolve it, although I've already covered it a little bit already. I'm going to cover it in a bit more detail. Uh, I'm going to start talking about data types. You guys should roughly know. Yes? I know. I know. No, you're not missing any sections. You're missing the table of contents slide. For some unknown reason, I saved it, closed a PowerPoint, uploaded it. When I reloaded it here, my two points were gone. So I'm going to chalk that one up to Google Drive, getting confused and rewriting it with the old copy. The only thing that's missing is those two points. Um, then we're going to cover data types, roughly what the different kinds are that you can work with. Uh, I'm going to talk about naming conventions and uh, data integrity. Uh, these are the things you worry about when you're dealing with physical design as opposed to conceptual or logical designs. Okay, now the crow's feet on this picture are really tiny. However, this is something similar to what you've looked at. It's, for example, an order has many products. And how would you resolve this? It's resolved fairly easily by creating the an in-between table. Squeak, 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 squeak. They don't even realize I'm making fun of them. <laughs> you know? Okay, so this is the many-to-many -many setup. Now, this has advantages and it has disadvantages, uh, the way it's designed. The advantages are that, well, obviously it'll pick up uh, the relation fairly easily. Uh, this is what's called, um, the one in the middle, the table in the middle is called a, um, an associative entity, you know, Netflix is buffering for a second. 
that's called an associative entity. And essentially the way it works is it takes the primary key of two tables, combines them, and basically makes that the primary key. And they're also foreign keys at the same time. This is an OK resolution. Actually, I should say it's a, the industry standard resolution to that particular um, challenge. It's, it's OK as long as you don't start throwing in a whole bunch of other fields down here that need to be also unique. Um, if we want to tra track dates and times, um, let's just say you need to track something that also has a timestamp on it, and you need to be able to put the same two items. For example, customer A bought product B yesterday, and then customer A bought product B again today. So they went to Starbucks, had a um, half-fat latte with soy milk and, you know, 16 other uh, instructions yesterday, and they're going to have the same thing today. And they're using their little loyalty card. The loyalty card keeps track of what you buy. You might not realize it, but they do. That's how they know how, how much to gouge you for their products. Because, you know, the stuff that's really popular tends to be a little more expensive. Why? Because they know they can get away with it. So once you start tracking other things in here, uh, this particular layout kind of starts falling on its face. The, the key to resolving it in a more complex situation is you create a distinct primary key for it, and then the two foreign keys are just foreign keys and they're not part of the primary key. That's how you resolve the two styles. So you end up with the middle table looks either like this, which in this case is order ID and product ID. Or you have something like this, primary key, which is ID, foreign key, foreign key, now, this one is becoming more and more the accepted method over that. And I will actually explain in about seven slides why this is starting to become the, the accepted approach. But I will um, put a small hint on the board. Okay, for now. It's a synthetic key that's the primary key. Um, and when I get to why I talk about naming conventions, I'll explain why that's important and why it's becoming the standard. OK. That's all there is to resolving many-to-many -many relationships. You create a table in the middle with foreign keys. Done. Yes? Yeah. No, 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 it's completely synthetically gen generated. Yes, when you create one like this, it's a synthetic key and it's self-contained. It has nothing related to the other fields in the table whatsoever, and that's the point of a synthetic key. No, it has nothing to do with the others. It is a value that is completely unique within its table. Within that entity, within that structure, it is unique. 100% unique within that structure. The same value might be elsewhere, but it doesn't have the same meaning. Just like one can be one can be one, but one in different places might mean something different. So this is a synthetic key, and that's its purpose in life. Like I was saying, this is starting to become the more accepted uh, method. And like I said, I'll explain why it's becoming the more accepted method in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, so when you're essentially resolving many to many, you end up with this or this. Like I said, this is the accepted theory method from the last 30 years. This one has been popular for about five. Actually, I can't even say it's popular. It's becoming more popular. Uh, five, six years, something like that. All right. So 
The next thing we're going to talk about is how to choose your data types. But now, before I start talking about all the different kinds of data types you can use, I'm going to have some things you need to think about first. Uh, when you choose your data types, you have to take certain things into consideration. And this is comparable to when you're dealing with data types in Java. How big is the data? How much room do you need? Now, in strictly typed languages, you actually have to be pretty explicit about how big certain things are. In database servers, you know, depending on what you try to do, you know, you can get away with really big stuff by just being slack. Um, but as a rule of thumb, you want to target, you know, a fairly decent amount of space, but not too much. Um, is it a, no, a number? Does it have decimal places? Here we go. Hang on. There, it's back. Um, why do you have to worry about whether it's numeric or it has decimal places? Because there's different data types. Now in Java, I think if I remember, you've got integers, floats, and reals. Or I don't know if you even know reals. I think everything's a float or an integer. Uh, with database servers, you have, you know, eight or nine kinds of numbers, depending on which server you're using. That's why it's important to know whether or not you need decimal places and just how much room do you need after the decimal place and what kind of rounding rules you want. Um, if it's a date, I suppose I have a question mark at the end. Uh, if it's a date, uh, should you include the time? In other words, is the time important to the data you're tracking? In some systems, all they care about is the date. In other systems, they care about the date and the time. When did something happen? For example, I'm sure Google cares when something happens point in time. Amazon really cares when you place your order. The banks, they usually care when you put your money in. And they kind of get upset when you take the money back out. But, you know, it's all a matter of precision. Sometimes there are things that aren't so important about the date. What's the first day of school? That's a date. Do you care about what time it's at? No, because that depends on each person's timetable. That kind of stuff. Um, how big is the text? In other words, if it's a text field, how big is it? Like, if you're tracking somebody's name, it's not that big. If you're tracking articles, well, that's a lot. It could be a lot of text. So you have to determine what kind of text and the size of it. And then there's something that the last one I have to say is I say, just say no to blobs. It's worse than drugs. Uh, blobs allow people to get lazy. Blob stands for binary large objects. And I'll be talking about those a little bit in the data types as we go. Um, essentially, Blobs allow you to upload a JPEG, a PNG, an MP3, and actually store it directly in the database. Now people say, hey, that's a great idea. I'll store the files right in the database. I can find them fast. I can do this. I can do that. Then your backups are in the terabytes. If it's part of the database, every night you do a backup, it's got to back up every single file that you have in the database. That means that your backups grow exponentially. So for example, the average picture on people's phones nowadays, I know my, my, the pictures out of my phone are about four megs each, four megabytes each. And you have 10,000 pictures in your database. You know, that's 40,000 megabytes. It doesn't sound like much. It's a lot. Now imagine you have to dump that every single night. So the backup takes time. And where I work, for example, our primary database of all our products we've ever sold and everybody we've ever shipped them to is roughly about three gigabytes when it's dumped. And that takes 15 minutes. Now imagine if you're doing a 400 gigabyte backup. Well, by the way, this thing's hosted on, on Amazon Cloud Services. So, you know, a disk guy was not even an issue. So if you can imagine a backup that's, you know, 100 times larger, it's going to take 100 times longer to back up. And you're going to get to the point where the backups are actually running right around the clock and nobody can use your system. That's the first reason why you don't want to use blobs. Second reason you don't want to use blobs, um, this is more of a problem with MySQL than it is with Postgres uh, because Postgres says no to blobs by default. Um, is MySQL was notorious for crashing and corrupting the tables. 
So the server would say, you'd be writing a blob into a file, and the server would say, no more. And then they would die. And then you go to restart MySQL, and your table's corrupted, and you lost three quarters of your content, including all those image files you had. That's why blobs are bad. Now, blobs do have a place. If you need to store a piece of text that's a little strange, um, things that have something called an escape character in it, which I'm sure most of you don't know what that is, and hopefully you'll learn it later down the road, but there's certain keystroke combinations. How many of you have had to type French characters using the Alt key? Alt-135, right? Okay, essentially what's happening is you're actually executing an escape code in Windows to make it push out the character. Um, that's, you know, a similar way of doing it. If your table is set up for a certain kind of language and you need to put a different kind of language inside of it, for example, it's set for Latin languages and you suddenly need to throw in Cyrillic, it's not going to go in well. So then what you want to do is you take the, you, you store that information in a blob field instead because the blob field takes it as binary data and that's it. That's the gospel truth of what goes into it. There's not much else you can say about it other than you know, that's what gets stored in there. Um, so I say no to blobs. It's a bad idea. They just don't work right. There is an alternative. Nope. They probably do. They, they, about, they probably do what I'm about to describe. Instead of a blob, what you do is you use a text field and you store a file name. The application takes the file places it in its magical place on the disk, and then it passes the file name back to the database, and the database just keeps track of the location of the file. So the file now goes on the disk. Every night the backups run. So I don't know how many of you understand how computer, real computer backups work, but essentially what they do is they, call, they do something called a delta. What's the difference between the previous backup and this backup? And it backs up only that. Which means if they add 100 files, it only needs to back up 100 files plus the changes in the database. So that's how, you, that's how you avoid using blobs. You use a text field to store the file name, blah. The only time you, like I said, use a blob is if you need to store strange characters, escape sequences or characters that don't belong to the current language set that's being used. Okay, but there's a few other things you should think about when you're choosing your data types. You should try to minimize the storage space. Not as important today as it used to be. Uh, this comes from an older concept where hard drives are small and you actually had to think about how much data you stored. Uh, but even that, why would you use up a mega space if all you need is to occupy 1K of space? Right? Why would you use a thousand times more space than you need? It's wasteful. It causes the database server to have search more because it's allocating room for all this stuff that's not being used. Um, anybody ever walk into a room where they had the tables laid out, kind of, like in a restaurant and they have the tables laid out kind of weird and nothing makes sense and why are they laid out this way and then, you know, the waiters have to walk three times as far to get their tables because everything's fragmented in the room. Database servers suffer from the same thing. If you have too much gapping, the server doesn't perform well. Um, you should also try to represent all, all possible values. So when you're designing, you want to try to target every possible combination of what might be able to go in there. That doesn't mean you're going to store everything as a text field because text fields will let you put anything into it. It just means that if you're going to use numbers, you should think about whether or not you're ever going to have decimal places or not. Or if you need to store something like postal codes, that kind of thing. Um, you should also plan your data types to improve your data integrity. And that means you should, in other words, is to eliminate illegal values. You shouldn't allow, uh, you shouldn't be using data types that allow the wrong kind of data to go in. For example, you know this data is a number. Why would you use a text field? Therefore, somebody can suddenly throw in a letter inside of a number and everything goes wrong. Therefore, if you're using numeric data, you use a numeric data type. If you're using text-based data, you use a text-based data type. That goes with, you know, stuff you probably learned in Java also. And then you should try to support all data manipulations. 
That one is goes without saying you're dealing with a database. You should be able to manipulate the data. And if you're working with dates, you should be able to do all the magic date math with it. If you're using a text field, you can't do date math on it. If you're doing text fields, can you multiply A times N? I'm not talking algebra. I'm talking, you know, take the letter A, multiply it by the letter N. No. You can multiply the character values, but not the characters themselves. There, that's what this means. It means if you need to do math or if you need to do something special to the data, make sure you pick a data type that applies. And now we're going to get into the list of the data types you can play with. All right, I'm going to start with the text types. Now, there's three common kinds. There's car slash character, depending on the database server. They're called different, uh, but they do the same thing. Car and character, those are fixed length strings. They occupy defined space at all times. Now, what does that mean? It means, I'm going to leave that there, but I don't need this one anymore. Okay. For example, we're going to go with the Canadian Postal Code. We know that it's six characters long. So if we were to find this as a car six, it means that it will occup always occupy six spaces, regardless of if you put in You just put that in and not a full postal code. Depending on the database server, mind you, it'll either backfill or front fill the string, so it's always six. So what it'll do is it'll take the first three characters and then tack on three spaces to make sure it's always six. And if it goes over six, uh, depending on the database server, one of two things happens. If it's longer than six on Postgres, it'll tell you you're an idiot. Give me something of the right size. If you're on MySQL, it'll go, I got you, bro. Snip, cuts the end off, doesn't even tell you if anything went gone. Uh, MySQL is notorious for cutting off data without telling you. Unless you have certain options turned on, which aren't by default. Or they weren't by default. I might be lying now, but they weren't by default. That's a character field. It has a strong advantage of, or historically an advantage of, it's fast. The database server knows how to index it because it's always six characters. It's always the same size, therefore it doesn't have to do anything fancy to figure out the size and how to index it to figure out what's inside. The problem is, is it can be wasteful. Why use up six characters when you only need three? Now, people are saying, well, that's only like three bytes. Or if you're dealing with foreign languages, it's six bytes. Or if you're dealing with Asian languages, it's uh, nine to 12 bytes, depending which character they decide to shove in there. So why would you waste this space? Which, you know, a few years later, after the, and originally, this is all we had was this. Your character fields were all the same size, and these were good because that's what the tape-to-tape -tape drives had because it knew exactly how many millimeters of tape it needed to move to get to the next record, roughly. So you could go whoop this far, then do a quick seek back and forth to find the edge of the record and read the data. On today's hard drives with SSDs, it's whatever. There's no performance gains to this. So a few years later, hard drives came out and people said, well, why do we need to be so specific about our space? Now we're worried about, we're not worried about access speed anymore, we're just worried about how much room we're occupying. Because a tape to tape, a tape could cost a hundred bucks. A 10 megabyte hard drive would cost a thousand. The tape would, you could, you know, three tapes would cover the same amount of space as the hard drive. So space was a premium, but it wasn't a speed issue anymore. So some pocket protector came up with the Varkar. That's variable character length, varying character or character varying, uh, depending, you know, there's there's four ways of defining it. And on Oracle, it's Varkar 2. They're reserving Varkar 1 for another purpose, for future purposes. So they're using 2 instead. Varkar never existed. 
Now, the way this works is it occupies the string, length of the string plus one bit. So if I were to do a varchar six instead, what it'll store instead of, obviously if it's longer than six, it'll truncate or bomb out. If it's less than six, what it actually stores is then it's, uh, there's obviously there's no way I can represent this properly. I'm just going to put a little asterisk here. That's what it stores. As it stores the three letters plus a data terminator. And each server does this little asterisk a little differently. Um, but essentially, it uses only three bytes of space instead of six bytes of space at all times. Modern database servers, there is no performance gain from one to the other. On Postgres, this is just as fast as this. There's no real reason to use the car ones anymore, unless you want to be anal about your data types. Text. Text is used to store large chunks of text. We're talking huge. Uh, MySQL has three different types because MySQL is special. Uh, it's the, mil the millennial of the database world. Um, Essentially, it can't just have one text type. It needs to have at least three. Why? Because it feels unique. It's got short text, medium text, which is also known as text, and long text. Long text is what every other database server calls text. Um, Oracle doesn't call it text. It calls it uh, a C lob, a clob. You know a blob, previous slide? Well, they call it a clob, character large object because they're Oracle. And Microsoft calls it a memo field. Whatever. Everybody else calls it text. Um, Postgres's text data type is limited by disk. Um, theoretically, you can store terabytes of data in a single field. You'd have to be absolutely insane to do it, but you can. Uh, it's capable of storing you know, gigabytes and terabytes of text. Each text field could hold the entirety of the old site. The old style encyclopedias we used to get as kids, well, a lot of you are too young to remember these, but, you know, we had a full set of the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was a kid. And, you know, that one text field could hold the entirety of that library in one field with one instance of the data. It's insane, the amount of space it can hold. But the same token, it holds lots of stuff, which means everything gets slower because of it. Uh, not usually that's at the application level, but it's, that's validation before it goes in. Um, there are ways of getting the database server to actually apply these rules. Uh, that I cover that kind of stuff at the end of the term. Uh, there's a few different ways of handling it. Um, so for simple rules, you can get to done at insert time. Uh, the rules require in triggers. It gets more complex. Uh, often this kind of data validation happens before it ever hits the database server. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's an open text field. It'll hold as much as you can give it. Because normally you don't search against text fields. Um, if you search against text fields, you have to use special kinds of indexes called full text indexing. And let's just say each of your text field holds one megabyte of text. And you've got, you know, a thousand rows. A full text index occupies, usually it's uh, the equivalent of 25% of the space of the original text which means you're going to add 25% more disk space, 25% more overhead, 25% more, more time spent writing to the disk. You don't search against text field unless you have to. The other ones, you can search against these in there because they're limited length. They're easy to search against. 
And that's why. Okay. The next set is the number types. Integers. You guys should know what integers are, right? Uh huh. Okay. Most database servers have three sizes of integers. Uh, specifically for Postgres, uh, that's the smallest number, and that's the big. I don't know how to describe that number. It's just got lots of numbers. Uh, it's an insanely large space. Uh, essentially, they're two, four, and eight byte integers. Uh, the big int is the big one in Postgres, and it holds, you know, lots. Um, decimal slash numeric. Depending on the database server you're using, uh, this either called des decimal or numeric. Uh, some servers have another type called money. Uh, they behave similarly to each other. Uh, money is a, a simplified version of the numeric or the decimal. And the way it works is you define the total size of the number that can fit into it, and then you also tell it how many decimal places it can have. So, for example, if I define something as ten comma two, that means this number can be a total ten digits, of which two are decimal places. So you have 10, 2, and it stops there. What it does is if you have more decimal places, it'll round until you achieve 2. It'll do the rounding for you. It's not going to truncate your decimal places. It does the rounding automatically for you. Uh, when I refer to the data type called money, which I actually it's right at the bottom down there, um, essentially it's just like numeric, but you can't have more than two decimal places. It forces it to two decimal places at all times. Um, and there's a money is not that popular with financial applications. Go figure, right? It's designed for financials, but financials don't like it. Does anybody want to guess why? Yeah, they deal with, well, they less than pennies. Uh, for example, when we track uh, exchange rates at work, we track the four decimal places. Why? Because we need to get every little percentage of money we can get off the exchange rate. Um, the more precise you're tracking, the more accurate your numbers are at the end of the year, especially if you're dealing with, uh, with exchange rates. If you're just dealing with Canadian money, two places is enough. The second you start doing international, and you're dealing with, you know, if your exchange rate is uh, 71, 71 cents on the dollar, but it's like 7182634, I think if I saw it today, which is what the current, what we're tracking at work. That's the exchange rate we're tracking at work. Why? Because we, if we do the exchange rate at that precision, eventually we get a little extra money coming back. According to the magic books. I don't know. Yes? Yes. And some currencies have three. Money is basically designed for uh, Canadian, U.S., Australian, anybody who uses the concept of dollars and cents. Uh, British pounds don't really work well like that because they have pounds and pences, which aren't pennies. Uh, then you've got other currencies which have no decimal places at all because their money's not worth anything. It's sad to say that, but it's the truth. You know, some countries in Africa can go buy a million dollars for 10 cents. Because their money's worth nothing. Um, they don't even have decimal places. So that's the decimals and the numerics. Um, as you can see, it'll let you have 131,000 and change digits before the decimal point and up to 16,000 decimal places afterwards. So you can go 131,000 places this way and 16,000 and change that way. So it's very, very precise. Um, they have real and double precision. Uh, those should look familiar for you guys who have learned about floats. It's the same thing. Um, 16 and 15 decimal uh, precision. And then it starts using exponents. 
serial and big serial, these are special data types. These are Postgres specific. Um, MySQL doesn't have this. MySQL has a, a modifier instead. What it is, is it's a four or eight byte integer up there, right? That's auto, automatically auto incrementing. So you create a table with your primary key set as big serial. It can hold this many records before something bad happens, which is integer wraparound. But if you manage to get to that many records, hot damn, you got yourself a good database. Like honestly, that's an awful lot of records. That's not for every table combined, that's for each table. So you have that many rows per table with the big serials. Um, essentially, the only purpose for serial keys, serial data types in Postgres is for primary keys. That's its bread and butter and purpose in life. Yeah? Because they need to be able to keep track of where the decimal place is and the rounding rules. It takes more room. It needs to know where the decimal place is. Actual fact, if you were to add this plus this and however the math works inside the database server and get rid of the decimal place, you'd end up with a number similar to that. It's just the decimal place floats and moves around. And when you look at the money down here, you can see um, 9223723685475878.08 Essentially that's what that is. It's basically it's an integer that has the last two places used for decimal places. Yes. Well, essentially, they're used for primary keys so that you can, it'll auto increment. In other words, it creates a value automatically for synthetic keys. It'll automatically populate your synthetic keys for you. So it'll go one, two, three, four, five until you reach that big honking nine, whatever the heck that number is up there. Um, yeah, that's what I mean by auto incrementing. Okay. Uh, the third data type. I'm going to talk about these. I'm talking about the top three common types of data types. So, in other words, you guys have learned about numerics in Java. You've learned about strings in Java. And I don't know if they've covered dates with you guys in Java yet. No? Okay. I don't even know if you do dates in level one because uh, dates are weird. Um, well, let's just say dates in database servers are even stranger. Because uh, essentially, if it's if Java behaves, and I'm not a Java programmer, so I can't, I'm talking, you know, off the top of my head, but if it behaves similarly to other languages, a lot of languages don't even have a real date type. They have a wrapper around you know, a number, and it converts that number to a date. And, for example, PHP knows about date, knows about time, and knows about date time, and that's it. Those are the three things it understands about dates, and that is all. Database servers, on the other hand, since their purpose in life is tracking data, they know about dates significantly better. So the first one's a timestamp. Um, in other database servers other than Postgres, that's also known as a date time. Just different servers call it differently, of course, because they all have to be unique um, or special. It also allows you to track the time with or without a time zone. So it's basically it's eight bytes of information, contains both the date and the time, and it can go back to 4,700 uh, BC to uh, 294,000 and change AD, and it'll track it in one microsecond precisions. So it tracks dates and times very, very precisely. Like we're talking, you know, um, speeds of bullets kind of precise. And that's why Postgres is so popular in the engineering and in the research fields and scientific fields, because it's so good at tracking dates and time. Then there's the date type. It's four bytes. And it can contain dates going back to 4,700 and change BC to 500, no, 5,800,000 AD. If you're still using Postgres in 5 million AD, uh, I mean, you know, you did well. If we're still around at 5 million AD, we're doing well. Um, or not, yeah. 
Then the other choice is uh, time with or without time zone. Um, essentially, it tracks just a time without the date. Uh, sometimes it's good for um, tracking, you know, uh, races and stuff. You know, how long, when did it start, and when did it end? Who cares what the date is? Um, again, one microsecond. Then there's intervals. This one's tracked in bytes. And what's kind of cool about intervals is it tracks the time difference between two moments. It doesn't care when the start was. It doesn't care about when it ended. It cares about how much time happened between the two. And Hundred and seventy eight million years of interval tracking. Two microseconds of precision. So, you know, that's the interval you want to track how many seconds since the dinosaurs were wiped out. To the microsecond of whether that asteroid impacted the Earth. Yes, it's been proven. Okay. So those are the common data types. I am, there are a few other specialty data types. Uh, depending on what database server you're using, they have different capabilities, which is why I don't include these in the slides, but I do discuss them quickly on the way by. Um, MySQL has data types for XML and JSON. Those are web uh, data types. Um, Oracle, same thing. They've offered those. They've had those for years. Postgres has geometry data types. You can feed in the center of a circle and the radius and it knows what a circle is. It can tell you how big the circle is. It can tell you where X and Y the circle is at and if it's overlapping any other circles. Uh, squares, polygons, it's got the full set of geometry. It has networking data types which means they can store IP addresses, MAC addresses, you can actually do substring searches on them. So you can search for an IP address by octet. And it knows what you're talking about and how to do it. It has, you know, JSON, because everybody has it now. It has XML data types, uh, but its XML data types are special because you can actually program it. Um, it's also got geospatial data types. Which you know, you know, on the third floor, you got those guys that walk around in the army uniforms all the time. They're here for the po for the GIS program, which is mapping. And you know what database they use for that course? Postgres. Um, why? Because Postgres is the only free uh, database that has uh, geographic information system capabilities. Postgres is able to track a location on a map in three dimensions. And it's not just that, it'll actually tell you it's at, you know, this coordinate by that corner by this X height, and it's this kind of terrain at that point on the Earth. Because they put it out for free. <laughs> okay. Why is Apache free? Why is Open Office free? Why is it's open source? It's free. That's why it's free. It's open source. You can download the source code and change it if you want. Actually, Postgres's license is the best of them all. You can download it, do a search and replace for the word Postgres, and call it My Database, and you're allowed to do that, and then rebadge it as your own product and sell it. It's the most liberal license out there. By the way, SAP. You know, you've probably heard of SAP. And they have a product called SAP DB. It's Postgres. <laughs> People are making money off of it. Um, actually, SAP DB used to be free. They, they just rebadged it because they added a few things of their own to it. And they didn't want to give out their changes that were specific to them to the community. But they did give you a binaries of it. No, they gave it up for free. You just didn't get to see the magic sauce inside. Um, but yeah, that's you know the data types you get from Postgres. Now there's more. Postgres has something like uh, 85 different data types. It's got a data type for everything. And then if that's not enough, you can make your own. 
you can create what they call hybrid data types or combi combined data types, which is two different data types combined. Three characters and ten digits. You can actually create a data type that does that. So it's kind of cool. Okay. The next slide I'm going to show you is one you got to pay attention to because this one's going to impact your assignments. Holy crap, the pins come out. It's amazing I say that how fast people's ears go poop. Right up till now, Dan's been droning. Dan said something about impacting an assignment. Naming conventions. This is two slides. Bit of a history lesson. Naming conventions used to be loose and free. Basically, nobody followed any rules. You did whatever you did. There was a reason for that, because space was limited. Now, anybody here ever seen Fortran? Yeah, okay, one, two. Okay, you remember your variable names couldn't be all that long? You had limits of what you could do? Well, databases used to be like that too. And you ended up with a database where the table was called A1 and the fields were like AA1, AA2, AA3. You had no idea what that was for. But because they had so little room to define the structure of the database that they got creative with, with that. Um, things were limited. So that was life. Now, what happened is companies reached developing their own standards and then, I don't know, in the early 80s, late 70s, somebody said, this is kind of dumb, and they created a standard. And that standard is actually the one that's used in the textbooks you guys have. So that modern database management, that naming conventions that they talk about in that book was developed 30, 40 years ago. But it didn't involve very much past that. Um, but what would happen is each company basically ignored these naming conventions and they had their own. So you'd change jobs and you had to learn a whole new set of rules for how things were named and how things worked and all that kind of stuff. And of course, it always caused all kinds of grief. For example, when I started working for Compaq, I inherited a database. And it was actually a really old database from years and years and years ago. And it had product information for stuff they didn't sell anymore, but they wanted to bring it in in such a way that could be searched by the text quickly. Ones that had to deal with legacy hardware. So they gave me this database, and literally, this is the example of the A table A1 and fields AA1 and AA2 and AA3, literally that's exactly what the internals of the database looked like. I had no idea what anything was. It took me a month to figure out what the data actually meant. I was basically spending days looking at this. If I could have met the guy who created that database, you know, there would have been a baseball bat moment. Because an entire, I was told that you got, two, you got a week and a half to fix this. It took me a month to even understand what I was trying to fix. It didn't look good. You know, considering I only had about a year and a half of uh, real world experience at that point, it was looking really bad. Oh, he's incompetent. Shouldn't have hired the cheap guy. Because he was young and desperate and hungry. <laughs> you know, so that's pretty much how that went. I've lived it. Now, thankfully, standards have evolved where people start having decent naming conventions. And servers now allow for big field names and table names, which is great. However, somewhere along the way, about seven years ago, I guess now, eight years ago, a product came out and everybody was all put in awe. It was called Ruby. And Ruby as a language sucks. Ruby sucks. But they had this one thing called, this innovation called Rails. Rails was a framework and it was magical. If you named your database objects a certain way, Rails knew what to do with it. And you didn't have to write any code to talk to the database other than say, get this record for me. Oh, thank you. Here, here's some new data to put in the record. Thank you. Magic. And then, you know, these guys came out and they, you know, everybody says, oh, Ruby on Rails, it's the shit. We're going to write all our new web applications on Ruby. And then six months later, every other major language had a framework and Ruby died. Why? Because every other language is already established. Well, there's still applications written in Ruby. Don't get me wrong. Shopify runs on Ruby uh, because they can't change it away from Ruby because there's so much infrastructure behind it written in Ruby. Um, 
You know, there are rubies still out there, but it's just, you know, they, people absorb the concepts of the rails. Like what was revolutionary was in the language is the framework it brought. And what happened is other, comp other groups of people started coming up with new frameworks. Struts for Java is a framework. Um, Python has one that's escaping me at the moment what it's called. Yeah, that's the one, Django. And then PHP. PHP, last time I checked, had 126 frameworks. Why? Because everybody thinks they can do it better than the other guy. However, even amongst them, they started saying, you know what? We should all agree what we call our database objects. That way our database is portable from framework to framework to framework. And in the end, in PHP land, there's five big frameworks. They all use the same naming conventions. There's Cake, Laravel, Kohana, Symphony, and something else. I don't remember the other ones because those are the top four. And those frameworks all agreed to come up with a certain naming convention. And if you follow that naming convention, magic happens. And here's that naming convention. So when I get you guys to start doing your physical designs for your labs and your assignments, which as you noticed, you haven't had to do any physical designs yet, this is the reminder. I am historically known for being savage over naming conventions. And I've had people, you know, an assignment's out of 30 points, 10 points for naming conventions, they get zero on the naming conventions. Why? Because I take one point off for every mistake. Not one point off for every kind of mistake, one for every mistake. Because it's 10 free points. There's no excuse. And here are the rules. Everything is lowercase, no exceptions. No camel case in database field. Now I get people that say, why? This is why the framework guys decided upon this. Half the database servers out there are case sensitive. An uppercase A is not the same thing as a lowercase A. They care. Oracle makes everything uppercase regardless of the data type. Or the, how you type it in, everything goes uppercase because Oracle lies. It, Oracle's case insensitive on your database objects because it stores everything uppercase. And when you type your SQL statements in, it magically does some stuff in the background make everything uppercase. Oracle lies. Postgres having been written on Unix, for those of you that might understand Unix and Linux and the Mac OS, it's case sensitive. Very much so. Uh, MySQL is case sensitive unless you tell it not to be. Or if you've installed it on Mac or Windows. So as you can see there, the rules are a bit vague. Microsoft SQL Server is case sensitive depending what region you install it in. You install it in North America, it's not case sensitive. You install it in Russia, it's case sensitive. Even as far as I know, the Russian alphabet doesn't actually really have a whole lot of, I don't know exactly how the alphabet works, but you know, apparently it really cares over there, but it doesn't care here. It just depends what code page you install the, OA, the database server on. So everything is lowercase, no exceptions. There are no spaces in your field names or your table names. Never see a space, ever. If you want a space, use an underscore. It would look like this. First name, okay? You can also do this. That's okay. And then in this case, for this, it's fairly easy to read. Okay, not so easy to read, right? Actually, that's really absurd, but you know, I'm just using that as an example. If you end up with a really long field name, it's unreadable. Use underscore to space out your words. If I see this,
That's equal minus 1. Because what happens is, depending on the database server, you have to do what's called identifier quoting, and every server does it differently, which means that you have to actually write your code so it's portable to different database servers, and you have to change your SQL for every one. It's just bad. That's a no-no. That's fantastic. That's okay. That's horrifying. Okay. That's why you don't use dashes. Uh, database servers can do math, and it sees a dash, and what's the difference between a dash and a minus sign? There isn't any. <laughs> it's the same character. It'll do the math. It'll try to go A minus B equals boom. Eh? No. No. Depending on the database server, MySQL will actually try to do the math. It'll actually take the numeric value of A minus numeric value of B and not actually tell them that it'll give you a, a, a letter. Which if you do A minus B ends up being zero because zero is right before the first A. <laughs> Go figure. Um, yeah. Okay. Table names are plural whenever possible. Exceptions would be names that imply plurality such as log, moose, you can't, there's no such thing as mooses. No. Moose eye, yeah. Or you can just call it elk. Because that's essentially what a moose is. It's a big nasty elk. Now, this is where the big difference is between um, the standard that's in the book you guys have been given and the modern standard that's evolving. That, this is also known as a de facto standard. This means that it's it's not a hard written rule. It's a rule that everybody's agreed upon. Microsoft, by the way, follows these rules on their frameworks. So whatever it is they use for C sharp, they follow these rules. Um, a lot of old school database profs are upset about this. The ones that have been using this for the last 30 years as they've been teaching, where the table names are singular for everything, they get met, they get upset that the rules are changing on them. But tables are plural whenever possible. There's a reason for that. The table contains invoices. In other words, it cont each instance is one invoice, and it holds many instances of invoice. Therefore, it holds invoices. <sighs> Magic, right? There's always issues with this. And the one that always gets me going, as a, because students always get mad about this one, people versus person. Because persons is also perfectly valid. Because you can pluralize the word person, you can plur and people's also, this is also a plural version of person. Because the English language is special. We can pluralize the same word two different ways. Whatever, I don't care, use whichever one you want. As long as you can justify your case. Because actually there's a difference between people and persons. People implies a group of people, persons means a group of individual people. Oh, that's 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 groups of groups, <laughs> right? So I'm just saying, you know, there's peoples, but that peoples means something different than people, which means something different than pizza person, which means something different than persons. That's the that's the killer. That's the one kills everyone when it comes to this plural table bit. Um, that's why I tend to try to avoid the word person as much as humanly possible in my database designs. I'll use customers, I'll use users, I'll use you know, uh, clients, anything but persons. Okay. Primary keys are always called ID, regardless. Remember I said I was going to highlight why it's called ID? Primary keys are always called ID. So for example, if you have a table called persons, <laughs> right? Now, the old rules, actually, first of all, the old rules would have been this. like such. That's the old rules. The new rules is this. Can anybody take a guess why people have settled down on this? Two hands at the same time and I think you yours moved first. 
No? Okay. He's, I saw his hand going like this. Then he touched his glass, and I'm not sure if he's doing the anime fix my glasses thing or not. I'm smart today. Okay, go. That's number one. Less typing. Number two. This also happened to become popular at the same time as object orientation. Why? Yes. For example, with the old way of writing it, like this, and you had this. If you created a class to retrieve it, you'd have to create a function for every table. Correct? So let's say you want to retrieve data out of the database for persons. You'd actually have to have each function for every table. So for example, you've got 100 tables, you have 100 functions to retrieve one record out of each table. You don't need a function for every record, but you need a function for each one. Now, like I said, I'm not a Java developer, so. But if I did And I wrote a single function, and its purpose in life was to retrieve a value from any given table, and it would return to you, to you as an array, which you guys haven't learned about yet in Java. You could just write a single function that connects to any table because the table structure is, is standardized across all the objects. If you know the primary key call is called ID, you don't have to write code to figure out what the primary key is. You don't need to guess what the primary key is because it's always called ID. Did you get the message yet that the primary keys are called ID? You'd be surprised. I guarantee on the first assignment, nine of you are not going to do this. Statistically, that's been the magic number. Between eight and ten out of a group of 110. Why? I don't know. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but it does make a difference. They're always called ID. The primary key is called ID. And I'll actually show you why in a second. Why, why it also is important. Okay, so we have persons and we have orders. Again, the primary key. Structure looks the same, correct? Which leads me to the next rule. Foreign keys are named using the rule of singular parent name plus an underscore plus the primary key of the other table. Sounds terrible. However, let's say this person has orders. The foreign key would look like this. It's the singular version Singular version of the parent table name. With the primary key of the other table. And essentially what this is saying to you is. You read this diagram. This order belongs to the person, to the person with an ID of whatever. Foreign keys are the singular version of the parent table name with the underscore primary key name. And since the primary key is always called ID, if you see any field that ends in underscore ID, you know automatically that is a, it is an it's a foreign key. The goal of this naming convention is essentially to have a self-documenting database. In other words, you can look at the structure of the database and derive what's related to what based on the field names. 
based on the object names or the entities or the table names, depending on what system you're using. If you follow a set rule, you can hire somebody new and you say, we follow this naming convention. You give them a little piece of paper that looks just like my slide and they, within five minutes, should understand how the database works. At least how the structure works. Not necessarily what everything is, but they'll understand. I'm looking at this table and it's got an underscore ID. Oh, that's a singular version of that. Oh, there we go, magic. The other perk of this is the frameworks automatically dis distinguish what the relationships are with this. That means when you retrieve objects, it knows automatically what the bits and pieces are because you're following certain rules that everybody's agreed upon. It's pretty cool. How would we draw that? Actually, not that far from that. I'll show you. That. Well, actually, we're going to be doing some physical design at the end, and you'll see it then. Yes. No. No. Well, for example, if you do a select, you, first of all, you're using a join to pull from more than one table, which is like, you know, four weeks from now, three weeks from now. But if you're doing a join, you're being explicit what connects to what anyways, otherwise the join doesn't work right. And you also use uh, table prefixes to identify which table you're pulling from. So there's way that it's up to the developer to actually tell the database what it is that you want. Database servers are smart, but they're not very smart. You know, they're, they're kind of like that dumb cousin. He can dress himself, feed himself, but, you know, he can't go to school every day because there's a tool. I don't mean the ones that are challenged. I'm talking about the ones that are just too stupid to go to school because they think they don't need to go. That's the type. Okay, so those are naming conventions. This is the one where you're going to, if anybody's going to lose points on the assignments off the top, that's the first thing I look at. I don't even look at everything else. I just look at that and go, and I go, ha, 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 that one wasn't listening. Ha, 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 that one wasn't in class. <coughs> ha, 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 that one doesn't respect me. <laughs> Zero for you today. I'm just kidding about that last one. I don't care. Nice. All over myself. Okay, two more slides. Now, there's a few other things that come when you're doing physical design. And that's controlling the data integrity. Whenever you design a database, you can set the default values. Certain fields should always have a default value. For example, you create a new order and it has a type of new. Maybe you should define that as a default value. Often, you'll have fields that are designed for tracking dates and times such as a field when the record was created, the timestamp of when the data was added to the database. You probably want to set a default value on that so it always gets set. You don't trust the programmers. Because as a rule of thumb, as a database designer administrator, I don't trust the programmers. Why? Because they're lazy. How do I know? Because I'm the programmer. <laughs> Often I'll forget the rule. Like I'll have certain rules and I forget about them by the time, by the time I'm done doing the design and I spend two months developing, I'll forget what the heck the rules were. So if I set the rules in the database, I don't need to think about them anymore. They're there. They're taken care of. Um, range control. Not all database servers support this. Postgres does. You can say these fields cannot have more than value X or less than value Y. You can set a range of values, and it, if you go outside those values, it explodes and says, no, you're not allowed to do this now. It's like having a curfew when you're a kid. You're home by 9. They walk in at 9.30. There's an explosion. Null value controls. Okay. You guys have learned what nulls are by now, I hope. Vaguely understand what a null is. Right? So roughly know what a null is. It's not an empty value. It's an absence of value. Um, database servers love nulls. And it has a rule. You can make a field null or not null. If it's not null, it means that field is required. It has to have a value. That value can be empty, empty string, because that's a value. 
a null is lack of value, you know, an absence of value. And then there's referential integrity. Um, that one we talk about later. Uh, but essentially, the referential integrity ensures that the database follows the rules of parent-child relationships. You can't add a record in table B if it does, the parent doesn't exist in table A. If you delete t records in table A, it won't allow you to kill it unless you kill the children too. Because database servers don't like orphans. All these, yeah, people are going, yeah, that's kind of nasty. Yes? There's ways of doing it. Um, that usually involves triggers. That's at the end of the term. Uh, check constraints are simple, as in this value must be less than 100, or eight, the character length must be 25. Those are simple rules. The complex rules come down the road later. Um, but essentially, referential, referential integrity is, you know when you draw your little your diagram and you've been doing little crow's foot? The refer referential integrity for forces those rules to actually be applied. And not all database servers offer the same functionality as far as RI goes. Postgres supports absolutely everything. MySQL, depending how you design your database, it ignores them completely. Or it doesn't, depending how you decided to design your database. It's just special that way. All right, last slide. Denormalization. Now, you know how I had went through that all that process that week, last week about normalizing this and normalizing that and these are the four steps and blah, 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 blah. And then you design your database and it's slow as hell because you broke it down so much that there's too much overhead. So what happens is sometimes if you need to do a lot of reporting, you want to denormalize the data. In other words, you want to summarize it. And essentially what happens is you get a benefit if it usually improves the performance of the queries. However, it uses up more space, and then there's risks for data integrity. Um, and essentially, common opportunities is no one-on-one relationships. Then there's collapse them together. Um, all kinds of various opportunities. I don't actually even test you guys on those four, so just read this on the slide, and I'll give you an example of one in the real world that I've experienced having to normalize. About six years ago, I worked for a company where we wrote reporting, a reporting system for a company called Trialto. And I can actually talk about this because it's not a secret. Trialto, many of you probably don't know who Trialto is. How many of you have bought a bottle of wine at the LCBO? Or at the grocery store? Or whatever? Okay. All the wine, in, I'd say about 6% of the wine at those stores came from Trialto. Trialto is a Canadian corporation that represents vineyards from around the world to import wine into Canada and then distribute it. Now the catch is that every province reports their data differently. So what happens is they'll ship 26 cases to the LCBO. The LCBO will take those 26 cases, spread them out amongst the different locations. And once a week, Trialto could connect to their service and download how many bottles of each wine was sold. And how much did it sell for, what time, when did it sell, you know, what days of the week, that kind of stuff. Now, Ontario's once a week, Manitoba's every three days, Alberta's every five days, Quebec is nightly. <laughs> Just saying. And Quebec's data is very comprehensive. As in, you don't just find out your products that sold, you find out all the products that ever sold every day, at every location, every single bottle of beer, every bottle of cognac, and every bottle of wine. So anyways, you can imagine how big this data gets really fast. Um, so what happens, we'd have to take all these different pieces of information. Of course, all the files are laid out differently. All the data is differently summarized by each location because the LCBO can do better than the SAQ. No, they don't. The SAQ is the best we had to deal with. Go figure, something done right in Quebec. 
you know, Alberta's was pretty good. BC's was horrible. And Manitoba didn't bother to do it themselves. They just gave their data to Alberta and got Alberta to do it for them. <laughs> no, really, I kid you not. That's literally how it worked. I don't know if it's still like that. It's been years, but, you know, that's how it worked. So what happens, we take all this data that comes in, it's laid out all differently, and we actually summarize it to a common denormalized format. This bottle of wine in Quebec sold this many units in this time frame. One after another after another. Any given night, we'd add 30,000, 35,000 rows of data because the Trialto represented that many different kinds of wines. Not vineyards, these are different, like a vineyard could have 26 different products. So they'd have a report for 26 products times every vineyard times every province. Every night it had to run. We kept it. Because sometimes, sometimes we needed to go retrieve the data, so the database was huge. Nope. Because we knew what we were doing. <laughs> Do you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Uh, the, the, the backups would take an hour and a half. So every night at midnight, the system would shut itself off. They'd do a backup and come back. Um, this system would also allow you to actually real-time query in Ontario where the wine was. You could say, oh, I want to find a uh, 2014 uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, La Vieille Ferme. You can actually tap that in. It would tell you what store has it and how many bottles they've had as of last night without having to go to the LCBO store to actually find, try to find this product. Uh, well, Trialto cared a lot. The company, the head company, the umbrella company cared a lot because they knew which vineyards were producing the most for them profit margin wise because they took a cut off the top of every bottle of wine. So that database was very, very useful. It's full of interesting statistics. I still have a copy of it, I think. No, I deleted it. That's right, I had to. After I realized I shouldn't have it anymore. Uh, but I did have a copy of it up till about four years ago. Um, but it was a really interesting data. And that's, that's an example of the normalization because the data would come in, we'd store it in its original format with all the tables and all the different pieces of data, and then we'd normalize it nightly so that the guys could actually run a report the next day and say, I want to know, you know, in Toronto, what was the best selling, top three selling kinds of wine in Toronto? Bang, so they can actually plan a sale for the next week for the ones that didn't do as well. That's an example of denormalization of huge data sets. So that's an example of a many, many with non-key relationships being simplified, uh, reference data being pulled in because each wine had a specific case size. They would come in a case of six, case of 12. Instead of having to do all these connections every time you did the data request, you do actually store it as part of the normalized record. So the lookups were faster, speeding things up. It's for reporting purposes and data warehousing. I can guarantee that Amazon denormalizes a lot of data. So they have their daily transactions at the end of every day. Actually, I think they do a part through the day, obviously, by now. They summarize the data, and then so that their sales reps can actually go look, you know, what kind of cat cam sold the best last week? Maybe we can have a lightning sale. That kind of stuff. They, they do that kind of uh, material and reporting. And they know how to sell it to you, right? Because I remember when I was a kid, somebody would go to the liquor store and you get a brown bag and you hit it. Now you go to the LCB and you walk out of there going, woohoo! I got me some, uh, picked up a bottle of Finlandia and a bottle of this and look guys, they gave me three free shots when I walked in the door because I wanted to try new products. Just, you know, saying. Okay, now I have lost my black marker. I fell, thank you. Okay, we're gonna do a quick on the board design session. 
Um, I was planning to actually not talk so long on the first half, so we're going to keep it somewhat short. We're going to do a pet adoption agency. So what does that mean? Hello, lights. Still not getting all the lights. Okay, so pet adoption agency. So for example, the SPCA, they let you adopt pets, or cat rescue network. But we're gonna go with one that's generic, not specific to cats. Um, so in other words, the, L uh, the not the LCB, oh. <laughs> the SPCA. So you go to the SPCA, and you go to adopt an animal. We're going to design a database that lets us track the pro the data that's associated with that. So with any design process, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify all the entities. And we're obviously we're doing a clean room implementation. I have not given you any documents. I have not given you any forms. I haven't given you anything to work with. Somebody went out, had a dream quest, came back, said we're doing a database for pets. Who had that dream quest? I did. So. For starters, what are the big entities that has to do with the pet adoption? There you go. You know, I had this disgusted look on my face for a second, and you know why? Because normally it takes at least seven entities to be shut up before somebody thinks about the animals. <laughs> hey? Because I'm doing a l conceptual, and because my handwriting is horrifyingly bad, and my uppercase tends to be easier to read. Okay, animals. What other entities are there? Customers, adopters, customers. Hey. Okay? okay, so that's three different categories of stuff. Okay, I'm going to call it customers for now. Uh, there was also somebody who said vets. I'm going to put down something called staff instead. And staff implies plurality. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to put that down as an attribute for the moment. I had a hand right around out front. Yeah. It wasn't you, but I'll take you. Good locations? Or kennels? You talking about the box that the animal's in? Sure. Any other big ones? Centers, locations? Okay, I'm going to cut it off. Okay, one more. I'm going to cut it off here because I want to actually get through the whole process. I've been watching my old lectures. Yes. <laughs> you guys are pretty damn accurate right off the bat. Because uh, I've used this example for years. Okay. This is, right now we have ourselves a roughly conceptual without any relationships. The next thing we're going to want to do is throw in our relationships. So. Where do we start? Customers to animals. What kind of relationship would that be? Yeah, well, okay, fine. Okay, let's put a little diamond in here. Yes, because a customer can adopt more than one animal, right? 
Therefore, we do. Like that. Each animal can only be adopted by one person, but person can adopt many animals. Locations of kennels? What kind of relationship is that? One to many? And then you said kennels to animal, right? Locations to staff. What kind of relationship is that? Could be. Yes. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Animals to rec medical records. What kind of relationship would that be? Hey. Yeah. Well, a rec an animal can have many records, but each record is only for one animal, right? Because you know, the animal came in, the animal was inspected by a vet. There's medical record number one. The next day, the vet gave the animal his shots. Medical record number two. No, these are just the objects. Like such. And now the last one we got left is the only thing that's not connected right now is the animal to the kennels. That's our location. Now this is where things get a little weird. Well, that's a terrible looking diamond. I'm going to do a many to many on this one. And anybody want to take a guess why? Hey? <laughs> no, yeah. many, many makes everything harder. It's like a guy who's got one, one girlfriend. Everything's harder. <laughs> sure. However, we should also keep track of once an animal's been adopted, the animal doesn't disappear out of the database, does it? Because they have to keep track of the animal was adopted and by who? But their kennel gets reused. So we should know where the animal is stored. Because let's say there was an animal in kennel, no, there's a cat in kennel number four. And he gets adopted and the cat gets sick. Then they have another cat in kennel number four again. That one gets adopted and it also gets sick. They're going, going why the heck are all these cats getting sick? Oh, they were all in kennel number four. And then they find out that the air conditioning unit was dripping on top of kennel number four and they called pneumonia. Great imagination, eh? But that's why you'd want a many-to-many -many on this so that you can keep track of where each animal was in what kennel. Each kennel can be reused for more than one animal. And theoretically, each animal could be moved from one kennel to the other, right? They're at the head SPC, and then they get moved to pet smart number one, which is in slot number three, pet smart number th two. You know, the animal's moving from one spot to the other spot. We should keep track of where they're at. Whereas that spot can get reused anyways. So... All right, this is a super simplified version of this diagram, believe it or not. Normally, it's a lot more detail than this. Um, that's our rough conceptual. We should be adding on all kinds of uh, insta a lot of uh, attributes on here. Um, name. Address. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. For now, I'm going to pretend I put in all the attributes. My handwriting sucks, and it's going to really be terrible by the time I'm done. It's just going to be a big black blur. But this process, you guys should know by now because you've done two of these in labs. What we're going to do is we're going to change this into a logical than a physical. And I'm just going to do it on that board because 
that's the one that seems to be no this board that board yes yeah we'd have an id But what I'm going to do in a minute is I'm going to do the, the logical, and then we'll do the physical, and then you'll see where the magic happens. Okay? So we're going to do our, our logical. Okay, I'm just going to make everything lowercase going forward. Now, right now I just added the, key, the word ID on there as our primary key. And normally we have more attributes that apply to an animal. And I'm actually going to get you guys to start listing some of them out. What are some of the attributes of an animal? <laughs> have you had problematic animals in your life? Yeah, there's condition, there's description, there's all kinds of things. Okay, I'm going to go with the name for starters because I was happy with that. Uh, the age... Uh, yeah, we can go with the age. Okay. I before you. G A L. Whatever. I can't spell the word weight. Okay. So people G H T A. Eh? You know, I always have to write it twice to get. No, that's not right. That just looks wrong. Okay. Okay. Weight. Size. Uh, people are shouting out that other stuff. I didn't put that in the date of birth because often they don't know when the animal was born. They know roughly how the old the animal is, and often that's an estimate. <coughs> because sometimes some animals show up to shelter, and they're in horrible shape, but they're only two years old, and they'll get some animals that come in that are ten years old. They look like a two-year-old. So you can't. You have to. They took a guess at the age of the animals, right? So at least some of these attributes. Now we had somebody saying species and breed. I'm going to put down the word description. I'm going to stop there. Height will go under size, because I can't spell the word height either. <laughs> I don't know why it always takes me two tries every time I type it. <laughs> so it's just stupid words where I can't do it right. I can database, but I can't spell. Okay, we're going to go with this. Now, as part of the denormalization process, in here there's a few things that are we could get rid of, or we could move out. Because, yeah, exactly, species, there's only a finite list of species, right? Cats, dogs, birds, reptiles, small animals, things. <laughs> By things, I mean like tarantulas. Actually, did you know the SPCA won't take uh, tarantulas? Hey? Eh? <sighs> animals have four genders. Male, female, spayed, neutered. They, they're actually treated independently. A male is either a male or it's been neutered. If it's a female, it's been spayed. Don't assume it's gender. <laughs> you know, I was waiting for somebody to set me up on that one, you know, all the whole time. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I've been able to use that line now for three years. I'm actually going to break out species also. Now, breeds are cats, dogs, whatever. Actually, no, species are cats, dogs, and whatever. Breeds are specific subsets, you know. you got a dog. It's a Sammy. Best breed ever. It's a cat. Cats have a couple different kind of breeds. Yeah, they're mutts. Actually, I'm not allowed to call them mutts anymore. It's offensive. No, really, apparently I've been told it's offensive to call them a mutt. They're a mixed breed. Everything's offensive. 
Okay? But, you know, you got for cats, you know, you'll have like Himalayan, you'll have Blue Russian, you'll have Asshole. You got different breeds for cats, right? Often they'll, they're a bit of everything. Now, remember back in the day, a couple of three weeks ago, I talked about reference tables? Those are tables that usually have two columns in it. It has a primary key. And it has a description field of some sort. ID and name. IDs are primary key. The breed is also a reference table. It has an ID and a name. No, two columns. It's like a class has two attributes. Right? Two properties. Sorry, I'm using the long language. A class can have two properties. Lots of methods, but it has to say two properties. These are the properties of this. These are the not they can have many rows. You know, you could have one cat, two dog, three bird. That's what would go. Those are the instances. That's the def definition of the instance. However, this reference table is a little special because it needs to refer to the species. Why? Because do you ever hear of a Himalayan dog? Do you ever hear of a lovebird cat? I've heard of a, a cat with a lovebird inside of it. My wife doesn't know. <laughs> so suddenly we need a foreign key. And this is where, you know, I was talking about the whole naming rules. And this is where the naming rules fall over. And I like using this one as an example. Because the word species is a stupid word. Why? It's a word that's singular and plural at the same time. It's the opposite, opposite of the word moose. Right? This should be breeds. So this would be species ID, which is a foreign key. Like such. That's our rule. Now we can look over here. And we have species and breed in here. We could actually get rid of this. And the only thing we need is the breed ID. Does somebody want to take a guess why we only need the breed ID? Because it connects up, yes. The gesture guy at the back. The breed ID tells me the breed. The breed tells me the species ID, which tells me the species. We don't need another connection to here because we can derive it from our relationships. And what I'm going to do, just to keep this nice and short, I'm going to assign data types now. So I'm going to let, because I've got 10 minutes left. This would take, you know, normally I give myself an hour for this. So. So I'm going to give this some data types and some rules. If this is Postgres, this is going to be a big serial. Like such. Yes? Yeah. It doesn't take up any more room. Just make it big because you have you can. It doesn't take up any more space on the disk. And you know, somebody out there may come up with a day where we go to space and we have all kinds of new species. And then you can adopt the purple slime from Sirlox. Who knows? It's giving you more potential. Sure, if you want to be angle retentive. It doesn't take up, okay, one occupies four bytes, one occupies eight bytes. How many bytes are on your hard drive? You could theoretically, yes, the minimum amount that does the job. As a rule of thumb, 
However, when you start going to the physical side, if there is no downside to using the bigger size, just use the bigger size, especially when you're dealing with numbers. Now, text is different, right? I mean, eight bits, with eight bits, you know, you can count a fair ways, right? One, two, three, sorry, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, right, one-handed. I can count 12 on one hand. And that's what, four bits. Numbers take up no room. The letter A takes both hands to represent. That's why you don't care about space on integers. There's no reason to never use big ints unless you're dealing with legacy systems where there's limited space. Name. Now here we'll care about space. Well, you're going to use a var car. And we're going to do give it a reasonable limit for the name of the animal. And I'm going to give it 50. Although I have seen animals with names longer than 50. I just don't remember off the top of my head. It was absurd. Third of the line of, you know, Falkor the whatever. No, really, I've seen stupid names like that. That was good. Thanks for feeding me in. Age. Age is iffy, right? It depends if you want to track it in just a set number of months, or if you can track it in years, or in years with a decimal. Depending what you choose, how you choose to track it, you know, it gets a little special. You can probably just go with months, and you can convert months into years, because, you know, take whatever number, divide by 12. We're going to store that as an int, just a straight up integer, not a big int, just make him happy. We're going to store it as an int, because if we have an animal that, can t that needs a number that big, it's not from Earth. <laughs> Weight. Uh, usually that's tracked in ounces or grams. Same thing with the size. If we're in Canada, it's in centimeters. If we're in the States, it's inches. Um, the breed ID went over here. Uh, the gender. <laughs> There's several different ways of handling this. We could break this out as its own separate table, so you can have a drop down so they can create new genders as much as they want without having to code for it. Or you could actually use it as a, the, one of the few cases you actually use a car field. Because in theory, we could store it as a car one. Because that'll hold the potential values of M, F, N, S. Right? Male, female, neutered, spade. So you can get away with just coding it. Coding it usually is a bad practice. Um, especially if you want to internationalize your database because actually male, female works in French and English, but you know, in other languages that might not apply. And you might end up with a case where the two are the same letter. Um, color. Normally people here start arguing, well, we should have that as a reference table. How do you describe a calico? Color is calico, right? It's a cat, calico cat. Did you ever see a calico? It's white with orange and black and brown, all splotches all over the place. It's like a tabby, but it's not stripes. It just looks like somebody went and with a paint and dust with a paint gun. <laughs> the color is, is subjective, right? Is the cat orange? Or is he cinnamon? Or is he ginger? Because he has no soul. <laughs> or marmalade, right? Don't assume my color. Okay, Varkar. Um, I'm going to give them lots of room to get creative with their name. I'll make it a Varkar 50. Why? Because it only occupies the space of each of the letters plus a bit. Description. That one we're going to make a text. Because you might be describing how it's such a wonderful little animal who's so looking for a friendly family, but does not like children and who will try to kill your dog. It's a description of your animal. You know you go to the pet store and they have this little card that describes the animal? We can actually make this, traditionally, 
Varkar was limited to 255 characters. In programming, 255 has special meaning. Which I don't know if they've taught you guys about the special meaning of 255. FF. You know, if you're talking about hexadecimal numbers, right? FF. That's 55. That's 255. That traditionally, Varkar was limited to 255. Nowadays, that's not true. Postgres lets you have like Varkar 10,000 or something. You could make it a Varkar, and then somebody decided to type an entire novel to describe this animal, and then they run out of space. And then they're mad at you because they couldn't publish their, their award winning document. Right? Now, text is, is similar to Varkar. Text occupies number of characters plus two bits. Why plus two? I don't know. That's just what it does. So a text, let's say the person types in 155 characters, it'll use 155 plus two bits. Well, actually, depending on the database server, they might actually include uh, two more bytes for uh, the code page. Um, on the other hand, they could also write in an entire frickin' novel of a 100,000-word 100, essay to describe this animal's temperament. That's why you use text. You don't, you're not limiting the end user. So you know you go to a website and they give you a text box and you can type to your heart's content? Except for the ones that say limit 255 characters? This is because they're putting it in one of these? Well, you do, but you don't, right? Well, when you're dealing with descriptions, you want to give the end user. I mean, today, what really, what's the limit, right? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Whatever you want. As long as your database server supports it, yes. If your database server is designed to use a Latin one code page, Chinese is not going in. Or... Arabic isn't going in, or Yugoslavian's not going in, or whatever the hell it is nowadays, Serbian, Croatian, or Montenegro, in, whatever the heck you pronounce that. But those languages are not going in. But if you design it as UTF-8, those languages will go in. Okay? Same thing over here. That'll be a Varkar. And that one's also a Varkar. Since this is a big serial, this one you have to pay attention to. This one, if this one's a big serial, this will be a big integer. Because what is a big serial? It's a big int that auto increments. The foreign key will be the primitive version of the big serial. So a big serial as a foreign key is a big integer. Why? Because you can only have one serial field per table. You should only have one auto incrementing field per table. Click, 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 click. And it is 10 to 8. 